people perceive your your competence, your capability, has a lot to do with your communication skills. So if you're able to express yourself, you're able to persuade and influence, and you have charisma, people tend to perceive you as more capable. The key word here is perceive. You may not be capable. But because perception is everything in today's world, you get that opportunity. But whether you can keep the opportunity depends on your real ability. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Sales Wolves podcast. I am one of your hosts, Tyler Harris. I'm Joseph Caldwell. And we have a very special guest here virtually, and that is Mr. Eric Fang. We will get uh, to him in just a second, but we collectively are the Sales Wolves. Uh (laughs) Yes. We got a delayed howl we got a from delayed Singapore. Howl. I don't know if it was the connection or... <laughs> it's the time zone, guys. It's, it's the time. It's that, that howl came from 12 hours in the future. In the future. <laughs> hey, how are the stocks going to do today, specifically world. Facebook? <laughs> hey, so let me... Uh, so this is episode 78. Um, obviously, we've got a guest, and, and I'm going to intro um, Eric real quick. Uh, but I want to start off kind of on more of a personal note uh, intro. So I met Eric at an event um, a few months ago in Huntington Beach. It was called Disruptive Innovation, part of the Disrupt Tour. And Eric was the closing keynote speaker. He closed out that event. And we had connected a little bit on social media beforehand. Uh, but when I got there and we got to meet, this guy is just one of the most genuine and real human beings I've ever had the uh, pleasure of being around, but he's freaking knows his stuff. Like yeah. he is sharp, like his keynote that he gave. And I told him we, we recorded a po- another podcast earlier today. I was telling him, when you talk about being entertaining and educational, like he wove those two so well. Yeah. Because what he was really doing, he stood up there and he gave a lecture. Like he had PowerPoints, a bunch of different key things that he wanted to convey. He had videos, but because of the fact that he was hilarious yeah. and just the transitions were so smooth that, that no one in there realized that they just got a full education on how to sell. Um, yep. But it was, it was awesome to watch. I was, in, I was honestly in, in awe. Um, so that's kind of the personal note, but to give you guys a little bit of an idea of who Eric is. So in 2013, Eric spoke for the first time in the Million Dollar Roundtable Experience, a prestigious industry conference attended by 6,000 financial service professionals from all over Asia. Eric received his first standing ovation and his career as a sales strategist took off. He became the guy to talk to if you want to become highly sought after in your market. Today, he's a well-known personality in the financial services, real estate, and direct marketing industries in Asia, having spoken in over 20 cities in Asia to more than 50,000 people. And I believe I heard that he's also going to be speaking later this uh, in a couple months in Budapest and Prague, which is pretty awesome. Will you shoot the dates when you're going to be there? Because I've been wanting to go to Budapest and Prague, and I would love to come see you there. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. That would be awesome. Yep. So, I can and plus I can introduce you to the people that brought me in so that they can invite you the next one. Awesome. Even Fantastic. Better. Because it's an interest industry. Awesome. Industry. That's beautiful. So Eric, first of all, thank you for being here. I know it's you know after 10 o'clock p.m. Um, your time in Singapore. And, and that's what I love about you, man. Like following you on Instagram, especially through your Instagram stories, you are on the go 24 seven speaking in front of crowds and, and teaching. And, and so what I'd love for you to do is just tell us a little bit about you, um, kind of where you're from, um, how you were raised, all that good stuff. And then let's bring you right into what your main focus is right now. And then we'll go back and forth a little bit here and uh, give everybody the chance to know Eric Fang. So man, just tell everybody a little bit about you. Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. I'm Eric. I'm from Singapore. Uh, Born, bred in Singapore with a little stint in America. So I studied in UPenn for a year and a half. It was uh, kind of a minor. So I was studying business in UPenn while studying computer science in Singapore. Uh, But even though I'm studying computer engineering, I've always wanted to be a teacher. Uh, It's always been my ambition. And I was just uh, on the sidetrack of sharing with uh, Tyler that my ambition of being a teacher was very apparent because uh, in Singapore, we 
we studied uh, just half a day, 7 a.m. to about 1 p.m., right? So we get to go home at 1 p.m. But I would actually stay back in school, I'll have my lunch, and then I would kind of creep back to the classroom to start teaching myself as a form of revision. And I would reenact every single thing that my teacher said. So if a teacher came in and he scolded somebody, I would pretend to scold someone as well. Uh, I know it's <laughs> I love it. That's, that's why I have no friends. But um, <laughs> um, I, I remember one day I got caught and my teacher was so uh, concerned because like, Eric, are you speaking to yourself? I said, uh, <laughs> And she said, Eric, if you really love teaching, then I'll get you some students to teach, right? Let's, let's go help your friends. So I started running remedial classes at what, 13, 14 years old. And that was my very first taste of teaching. And I love it. Um, and you know, the minute you get, you tasted something good, you, you never want anything else. Everything else would be second best. Um, and then coupled with me studying in America, I had a chance to meet some great motivational speakers. I met Toastmasters. Uh, Toastmaster is an international speaking organization. And all of a sudden I realized that, wow, I could actually teach on a stage to like hundreds and thousands of people. So I've always wanted to be a speaker, teacher, coach. But, you know, reality is always very far away from your dreams, right? So when I came back, I decided I did not want to pursue my scholarship. I just wanted to be a trainer. So I started um, teaching public speaking because that was the only thing I knew a little bit about. But my biggest challenge, number one, was I was extremely young. I was 24 years old. Um, and there was very little opportunity that was given to me because I have no experience. I have no corporate experience. Um, I was considered a greenhorn. Uh, I, in fact, I joined a speaker's association once and I asked for mentorship. And I remember that guy giving me his advice. He said, Harry, if you really want to do well in the speaking industry, either shave your head or get some white hair, and then you come and join us. <laughs> so, uh, ouch. Uh, I, I was extremely... Um, I met that I same was... guy, except I took his advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I remember I was very miserable. I was hidden in a classroom of probably 15 to 20 adults who do not want to be in the class. They were forced to attend the class, the company paid for it, and they were very difficult. Uh, I was unknown, I was invisible, and many of them were question my authority, they were question why am I there. So all of a sudden I realized that, you know what, the only reason why I'm seen as a commodity is because I did not position myself as an authority. I did not work on my brand, and nobody knows me. And, and unfortunately, you know, there's a saying that be so good that the world cannot ignore you. But that's just one half of a truth because being good is not good enough. You have to tell people that you're good because in today's world, there's just simply too much noise out there. So even if you're good, but you're quiet, you're gonna die a death of silence. Yeah. Um, so I think it was 2012 where I consciously set up a Facebook account and I started uh, documenting. Back then, of course, there was no Gary V, so uh, there was no one telling me about documentation. But what I was just doing was taking a lot of pictures of me training, uh, doing simple videos and snippets of me speaking. And that very thing that I did opened doors for me into Malaysia. And you see, the funny thing about the speaking industry is the minute you are, you are kind of popular in some other country, this is where your own country will want you back. It's a, it's a very subtle thing, right? But um, the minute Eric starts speaking in Malaysia, people go like, oh, wow, you know, he's uh, quite popular. Let's get him back. So that was when I realized that the photos I take are important. I realized that no one's ever going to know if I'm good if I do not give them a sneak preview of what I can teach yeah. and what I do. I've also realized that I need to show people who I hang out with so that by association, I will be able to borrow their credibility. Yeah. So I started actively doing that. And next thing you know, I started speaking in Malaysia. Uh, and then after that, China and then uh, Philippines and then it started spreading um, and that was when I realized that you know what I am I want to share this process with people because um, I love hanging out with salespeople because I think we think the same way salespeople are all hustlers we are competitive and uh, we want to win and yet at the same time we want to help people yeah. so it became a very natural group that I want to work with and I tell you the biggest problem that they have is they are spending too much time trying to sell a product but they don't understand that the selling environment has changed. Today, before you can even have a chance to sell your products, you need to first win the battle of attention and you need to win the battle of trust. Yeah. If I'm not paying attention to you and I don't trust you, no matter how good your products are, no matter how awesome you are as a yeah. person, 
no one's going to give you a chance. That's right. And that's how I started teaching about how a sales professional can become highly sought after. And, uh, and it's been uh, three to four years I'm doing that and just that I'm doing it in more countries. But the mission has always been the same. Wow. Man, that's awesome. I want to touch on something that you just said at the end there. You talked about the fact that you don't have the, if you don't have the attention, if you don't have the trust, it doesn't matter if you've got the best product in the world. I think there's a, I think there's an interesting dynamic and I think a fortunate position, a smart position coming from, okay, I've, I've got a good product and that good product for you was the ability to speak, the ability to coach, yes. the ability to train, the ability to lead. Now I need to go get the attention yep. and then build the trust. I feel like nowadays, because of social media, you have people that have the attention, but they don't have the trust and they don't even have a good product. Like they themselves are not a good product, but they've got a bunch of attention. So I love how I think it was Gary V, but I love the the phrase uh, where he talked about just because you have the attention, that just gives you the opportunity yep. to yeah. sell. The attention doesn't get you the sale. It just gets you the seat at the table to be able to present something for someone to make a buying decision. Sure. Uh, but I think coming from your perspective, that's the way it should be is you should build your product, build yourself, your brand, whatever that is, and then go get the attention. Obviously, if you can do it simultaneously, that would be beneficial. Right. Um, but I think that there's a, a, a lack of, <laughs> there is a surplus of attention yep. <laughs> and a lack of expertise that are getting that attention. True, and what that's like is, is if I'm grabbing attention and I can get to the table because I have charisma. Mm -hmm. I had a guy tell me one time, this was early on in my sales career, he said, your charisma will get you where your character will never keep you. And I went, whew, Ooh. I've gotta have something wow. to offer when I get to the table. I've gotta be able, and if you have something to offer, you build that trust, you have the attention, and you have whatever it is to back it up. Well said, wow, I'm gonna write that down. It's amazing, so what you're saying is that your charisma catches the attention, but what gets you the sale is your character and your, your whether the person trusts you. Right, because and along the way, if you trust me, it's built off of my character. You feel that from, from just by talking to you, I can tell that your character is here. Like you feel that with people. And that's something that I think is lost in corporate America and America, and I'm sure across the world, is that people, it's a, you know, you hear it's a dog eat dog world. Well, not if you wanna make it big. If you wanna make it yeah. big, you're gonna have the character here and then you grab this attention and you have a good product and the trust is built and it's a magic threesome. The, oh, fantastic. The interesting thing, Eric, that you and I were talking about earlier, you, you mentioned that it's not what you know, it's, and you can finish this for me, you said it's the perceived... Ah, okay, I, I was actually sharing with you about why I wanted to work on public speaking because yes. at the end of the day, it's about it's it's about perceived competence. Yes. And in the corporate world, back then, because I was in the corporate world, um, how people perceive your your competence, your capability, has a lot to do with your communication skills. So if you are able to express yourself, you're able to persuade and influence, and you have charisma, people tend to perceive you as more capable. The keyword here is perceive. You may not be capable, but because perception is everything in today's world, you get that opportunity. But whether you can keep the opportunity depends on your real ability. Mm. Mm. So one thing I wanted to dive into, wow. one thing I wanted to dive into real quick, uh, because it's one of the things that I find fascinating about your country, and one of the things that I admire about your country. So Joseph and I, we always talk about seeking discomfort. Uh, yep. that if you seek discomfort, the world will deliver uh, you pleasure. If you seek pleasure or seek comfort, the world will deliver you pain. Singapore. Joseph, I don't know if you know, but Singapore has a built-in structure for every single male to seek discomfort. What is that? <laughs> so if you want to explain that a little bit, Eric, but every single male has to be in the service, the military, yeah. for two and a half years. That's like Israel. You yeah. have to be in for two years. Yes. Which it's brilliant because it forces, it forces people into discomfort. Sure. So tell a little bit about that experience that you had uh, in the military and kind of how it grew you as a person coming out of that situation. 
obviously looking backwards, I would say that it was a great experience, but nothing was ever great when you're experiencing it. I, I hate it every single second. I hate it. Um, think about it, right? Because the place that I have to do my basic military training is an island. Uh, and I remember every Sunday evening at five o'clock, my dad would drive me to that, to that uh, jetty. My heart would be sinking because I know that I'll be there for six days hanging out with people that I don't really like, doing things that it's extremely painful for me. Uh, and yet, there's nothing I could do about it. Uh, and every Sunday, it was like that. You know, it's like in tears. It's just that I hide my tears and I'm just miserable. So it was like that for, what, at least a year. Uh, and the reason why it was painful for me, because in Singapore, basic military training, it's a lot of physical uh, discipline. You have to wake up early. You have to work in a team. You have to be strong. You must be able to do push-ups. You must be able to clear the obstacle course. So the problem for me is I was a nerd when I was in school, meaning to say I didn't really explore working on my physical strength. I mean, it's very different right now. In Singapore today, uh, going to the gym is a very cool thing. So everybody has a, a lot of muscles and strength. And so military today is a lot easier for them. But back then, you know, it's not cool to go to the gym. Huh? Nobody goes to the gym, right? <laughs> so I, I, I suffered a lot during those times where I was just physically much, much weaker than most of my friends. Oh. Uh, and so that was one of my biggest discomfort. And you know what's the worst part? Your parents cannot save you anymore. You know, back then when you were, what, 15 years old, 14 years old, when you go through trouble, your parents can still come in and protect you, you know. If you have a difficult friend, your parent can come in and step in. Your principal can come in and step in. I'm sorry, man, when you're in military and you have a problem with your combat friend, you have a friend, an issue with your, your, your soldier, nobody's going to help you. You will fix that issue. No. no one's coming to help you. And all of a sudden, I felt so alone when I realized that I have to rely on myself. So it was a lot of growing up I had to do during that two and a half years. You know, that's a that looking back, I can tell that was a good experience for you. And one of the things to teach my son, I, I've got a, a ten-year-old little boy. He turns eleven on um, Saturday, but um, the first sport that I put him in was wrestling. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted the first lesson in life that he learned was that if he wins on the mat, it's his fault. If he loses, it's his fault. Like you can't put it on anybody else. It's not a team sport. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. And if you win, good job. If you lose, you better figure out why. Like it's a, it's a, it's a thing to start teaching that early on. And I read somewhere that um, we grow the most in discomfort. Yep. And but a smart thing to do is to not let, not let life dish us discomfort in surprise, but to deliberately put ourselves in discomfort in a right. structured way. And it's exactly what you're trying, what you're doing with your children. Yeah. I wish my dad does that to me, well, but I was very loved by them. So I was very cushioned by them. Yeah. And then after that, they released me to the world. I had a culture shock. I nearly died. Yeah. Right? So, uh, I think, yep, you make a better parent than mine. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was funny a couple years ago, and Tyler and I have talked about this. But the business was doing great and everything was doing great. And I woke up one morning and I'm, I'm walking across, I'm walking across my bedroom to the bat, to the bathroom. And I, and I started thinking, I was like, man, stuff's too easy. Stuff's too easy, man. Life is going to deliver me some pain if I don't go get uncomfortable again, like nothing's uncomfortable. And so I literally, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I literally started taking ice baths. I started getting in ice water just Every morning I'd get in ice water and I would see how long I could stay in and how long I could take the pain. And, uh, and everybody made fun of me. <laughs> but, uh, but after you do that a couple mornings, you realize, man, not much else bad can happen the rest of the day because it's miserable. Mm -hmm. you know? So oh, it was just something I did to push myself. You know? But it's, uh, it's, it's all about setting up these situations where you can enter into um, massive discomfort by and choice. you can control it, right, by choice. Yeah. So, Hey, Eric, what I want to do on, on this podcast for the remainder is I want to see if we can get a little um, tactical here. And Absolutely. the majority of the people that are, that are watching and that are listening to this podcast, 
Um, they're in sales one way, or the other, one way or the other, as we discussed before. They're either selling themselves to do something on a daily basis, selling themselves to someone on a daily basis, or they're actually, that's their career, uh, is sales. Um, so I wanna come back and, and go back to kind of some of the points that you pointed out in Huntington Beach when we were at that event. The interesting thing about that keynote that you gave is as I was sitting there listening to you speak, many of the things that you spoke about, which was on sales tactics, sales techniques, um, in regards to insurance, financial services, many of the things that you talked about were the keys to our success in our business. One of those things that you mentioned was planting that seed of doubt. Planting that seed of doubt and then coming right after it with a solution to that problem. And that's exactly what we do in our, in our day-to-day uh, routine with our insurance agency. Um, so let's just kind of go from there. And I want you to be able to kind of do your thing. I mean, this is what you do on a daily basis is coach people, um, salespeople. And so let's touch on a couple of points that you would want to give our audience today uh, on some sales techniques, some sales tips, and things that they can implement uh, tomorrow. Sure. Um, I'm going to first give one that I feel is going to help them easily double their sales if they do it on a daily basis. And you know what's the best thing? All I need them to do is to do it five minutes every single day and they'll start seeing doubling of their sales results. So this is what you do. Number one, take a piece of paper and start listing down your top 30 customers. You see, a lot of salespeople, we spend a lot of time trying to get new sales, but we forget that it's a lot easier to get more sales from the existing customers. But we we understand because trying to keep in touch with our existing customers can be a lot of work. Hmm. But this idea I'm about to share with you only requires five minutes every day. So here's how you do it. So you list down your top 30 customers. Here's how I define a top 30 customer. They have to be customers that uh, has a certain amount of finance that allows you to then sell bigger premiums, that allows you to then be able to help them in a much bigger way. So that's one criteria. The second criteria is you must love them. Meaning to say that if you make all the money in the world, would you still want to hang out with them? You'd be surprised to know that many customers that we have, if we have a choice, we won't want to hang out with them. (laughs) Right. So we need to, our top 30 has to be people who we actually unconsciously want to spend a lot of time with them simply because we like them. So that's criteria number two. Criteria number three is they must have a huge network. They are either uh, an influence in their social network because of their position of power, or it could also be that because they are social butterflies and therefore they, they are very well connected. So I want to invest time in nurturing my relationship with this top 30. So the top 30 has to be people with the finance, they have people that you like, and yet at the same time, they have a huge network that you can tap onto. So imagine now you have all the 30 names written down on a piece of paper. This is what you do every day. Let's say today is Thursday, right? No, is it Thursday morning for you? It is. So Thursday morning, you take a look at the first person on the list, and maybe it's Tyler. Let's say it's Tyler, right? So the question I ask myself right now is, how can I add value to Tyler today? And there are multiple ways you can add value. Could I send him a piece of information that is going to be useful um, in the area of financial planning? Or could I connect him with somebody that would be of value to him? So for example, if let's say Tyler is somebody I'm trying to build a relationship with, I know he's about to publish his book, he's looking for a publisher, well, that's immediately something I could add value to him. I could link him up with people whom I feel can not only just help him publish the book, but secure interviews for him on TV and radio. So that's adding value, right? Or the third one is, can I invite Tyler to an event that I think is fun for him? It could be a learning event, it could be a a sports event. So I'm just giving you three examples, right? Teaching, that means sending something of uh, informational value to the person, or connecting, that means social, introducing people of value to them, or something fun, inviting them to an event where they can interact with you. So all I need to do is to think of how I can add value to Tyler today using one of those methods and then I go execute it. And then I'm done for the day. Tomorrow, That's awesome. so Tyler's name is right now at the bottom of my list, right? Tomorrow, yeah. I have Joseph's name on, the, on my list. And I'll do the same thing. How can I add value to Joseph today? Go do it, and then put Joseph's name at the bottom of my list. Hmm. If I keep doing that five minutes a day, 
I'm essentially staying in touch with you once every 30 days yep. effortlessly. <laughs> and two things are going to happen. Number one, the time will come where I actually deliver something that's of real value to you. And the only way I can deliver value to you is if I have intimate knowledge about you. And it takes time, right? I'm experimenting what is right. valuable to you. So it will come upon a time where Tyler will say to me, hey, Eric, you know what? Thank you very much. You know that person you introduced me to? The deal happened. It worked. I'm appreciative of you. Hmm. Now, Joseph, when someone says thank you to you, how do you reply to You are welcome. Absolutely, right? So now we don't say that. I'll tell Tyler this. I'll say, Tyler, if you really want to thank me, give me 30 minutes of your time for me to help you in the area that I'm really good at, which is financial planning. Or, Tyler, give me, you know, if you really want to help me, the best way to thank me is to introduce people who are like you, yep. who I can help referrals. in the area of my expertise. It's and beautiful. that's how you get repeated sales or how you get referrals. That's right. So that's one. Number two, remember we were talking about introducing uh, people to them or we're talking about uh, inviting them to fun events. Both of this occasion takes them from online to offline, right? So let's say I, I invited Ty Tyler, what's something that you enjoy doing? Um, I love playing golf. And growing a beard. He really likes growing a beard. <laughs> so let's say, for example, I know he plays golf and I have a common interest with him. Let's say I enjoy golf as well. I will invite him to golf with some of my business friends because I know he'll be of value to Tyler. Yep. Now, when Tyler say yes to me, I will add one more statement. I'll say, Tyler, do you know anyone who is like you who also enjoys golf? Why not invite them as well? Beautiful. And when I invite them, I now kill two birds with one stone because I get to add, I get to stay in touch with Tyler. Yet at the same time, I could I could tell Tyler, Tyler, you brought Joseph. Could you introduce Joseph? Tell Joseph why you work with me. Now Tyler is selling me to Joseph. Hmm. And see, that's that that's third party magic dust that only a third yes. party can sprinkle. We were talking about so this the other day. Yep. So this is exactly what you do for a list of 30 customers. And if and you if you do it, you can actually duplicate the same strategy for your top 30 big fishes prospects. Yeah. Mm. Because you must understand, if they are a big fish prospect, they have the budget. They don't trust you yet. That's or right. you are not approaching them at the time that they want to buy. And we will never know when's the best time to buy. So the smartest thing to do is to keep staying in touch with them on a regular basis yeah. so that at some point in time, they, when they're ready to buy, you are at the top of the mind. Hmm. And it only requires five minutes a day. I literally, I have a, uh, there's a financial planner in Charlotte that has wanted to do our 401k here at the office for the last five years. And literally he has contacted me every single month for the hmm. last five years. Wow. And if, and if I'm going to put that particular, what his expertise, if I'm going to put that in place, I'm going to go with him because I know he'll always be available. He's trustworthy. Like he's built trust with me and I don't even know him, you know? Yep. And that's it's how that works. A familiar, it's called a familiarity effect. Yep. Uh, or what some of us, we call it the mere exposure. Uh, something interesting for, for you guys. In 2005, there was a study that showed that a person needs to interact with a brand five to seven times before they approach the brand. Right. Today, in 2020, the coming years, we need to be exposed to a brand 18 to 20 times wow. before we approach the brand. So, and, and bear in mind that 80 to 20 exposures cannot be an advertisement because people hate advertisement. Hmm. That's why Tyler is crushing it because he's using content yeah. as a way to keep in touch with people. That's right. But because we spend a tremendous amount of time on social media. So this method is an offline method, but it works. And I always encourage people to do offline before they go online because everybody is going crazy about online. But mm -hmm. online is just a very good multiplier effect of That's what you right. do offline. So if you don't do the offline things well, what's the point of doing it online? That's hmm. right. And so... So that's why I started off by sharing with you guys this offline strategy. Because once you do it well, you can scale it online. And you can now stay in touch with hundreds of people. Offline has worked for thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> so that is true. Man, I love, thank you for that tip, by the way. And I think people will really be able to take hold. That's one of the questions that we get all the time is in regards to prospecting. 
And when they think prospecting, they always think of new. just reaching out to new, new, yeah. new, new. But if they realize that the conversion ratios or the close ratios, their probability of getting business from somebody new versus from a referral from someone that they've provided value to, that the actual time is way further or way better spent and uh, on the customers I, that they already have. I don't know if everybody caught what he said because he went through it fast, but you have your 30 customers mm -hmm. and then you have your 30 whales you're yeah. going after. So this five minutes a day here, five more minutes a day on these, and you can actually use the same piece of information. Yeah. You can match these up mm -hmm. so that you can use the same piece of information that you're providing value to this guy to a business that looks similar. And, and maybe on your whales, you don't just do one, maybe you do five. Yeah. Maybe you have a list of 120 and you do it. So, I mean, this is something that people can do yeah. if they catch on. It depends on how, how ambitious you want to be. <laughs> right. And, and the and the magic to that too is that it's all about creating a system of doing so. So like you said, five minutes. So whether that's in the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, the end of the day, to be, to be able to schedule and time block that time in uh, to where they know, okay, it's two o'clock. This is when I do my five minutes of following up uh, with Joseph today and then put them at the end of the pile uh, when I get done with them. But a lot of people will say, okay, crap, now I got to reach out to all my potential customers. And then, all right, well, let me get let me get this group of 30 together. And now I got to sit down. Now I got to call all these people and nothing ever and happens. And it's overwhelming. Yeah, they just it's don't. Absolutely. One of the things I, I tell people all the time is today, right, uh, whether we are talking about social media world or the non-social media world, there's one thing that remains the same. And that is, this is still a world built on trust. Without trust, no one's ever going to do business with you. That's right. The only difference is today, in the past, trust can be built during the sales appointment. But in today's world where you're inundated with competitors and there's so much black sheep in the market, trust has to be built before the sales appointment. That's the key. So if I can build That's trust good. with you before the appointment, when I see you, you're there not to consider the deal, you're there to confirm the deal. That's the difference. Hmm. So we need to do the trust building way ahead of time. And that's the reason why I tell people, you want to big whales next year, you've got to start building a relationship this year. Right now. So that you can yeah. capitalize on it next year. Joseph, Joseph yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, Joseph and I heard a heard a speaker a month or so ago, Dan Clark. Yeah. Um, he's in the Speaker Hall of Fame. An incredible, incredible speaker. But he talked about the fact that his I wish banker, he was my father. <laughs> yeah, I do. Like <laughs> <laughs> the uh, he talked about how his banker, the banker that he's used for years and years, is like an hour, hour and a half away from his home. And so he said, any time that I have to visit my banker, I got to drive an hour and a half. He said, but in all the years that I've done business with this guy, when I drive an hour, hour and a half to go see him, we never talk about business. Yeah. He's like, the interest rates are never discussed when I'm talking to my banker. And if there ever comes a point where I am having a conversation with him about interest rates, then that means that something has happened to the relationship where the trust has broken and that yep. we no longer are connected in that way, but you should build your relationships based on trust so that the business side is just an afterthought. Yep. You wanna do business with people that you like doing business yep. with, and you just understand that the rates are the rates of the rates, whether it is is yep. a little bit better or a little bit worse that I'm buying based off the relationship, which That's is right. Absolutely, and um, well, I, I mean, because I hang out with a lot of top salespeople, right? And uh, recently I had somebody who, uh, I, I think you guys are familiar with Million Dollar Roundtable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an award benchmark. Uh, during his first year, he got MDRT in 12 months. Second year, he got MDRT in 12 months. Third year, he got MDRT in eight months. Fourth year, he got MDRT in six months. This year, he got MDRT in two months. Wow. Uh, and he's one of my mentees, right? So um, one of the things that really work very well is because we spend one year building relationships so that I can sell to that person in one minute. Yeah. But you know what's the problem, Joseph and Tyler? I tell you what's the problem. The problem is today too many young people, they want to get the sale as soon as possible. Instant gratification. I tell you, the instant gratification is killing this industry That's right. because they're constantly thinking, of what's the fastest way I can convince them? What's the fastest way I can cycle them to get a sale so that yeah. I don't do all these things? I tell you, that's the problem. Yeah. So it's not a sales issue. It's a fundamental value issue. I think. That's right. And I'm, I'm having a lot of problems because when I mentor 
these people, I realized that they are just wanting shortcuts from me, and and they don't understand that if you wanna you wanna succeed in the long run, you need to play the long game. You cannot play right. the short game. That's right. So too many of us are too transactional. You need to send them to work on a farm for about about two or three years so they can understand the cycles and maybe of things. That's the problem because we have no farms in Singapore. Right. <laughs> we don't see rare cows. I mean, like right. uh, we don't really have cows. Oh, this, wow. this whole this whole uh, seed time and harvest is just it's just missed in the entire country. They just don't understand. They don't. Totally. Know. Yeah. Totally. Hey, we want everything like yesterday. Hey, yeah. Eric. We got about a little less than five minutes before we got to wrap up. I want I want to make sure that we give you the opportunity to talk about your book. So Eric's got a book, and I think it's so incredible because it's literally like a coffee table book for sales. Yeah, Joseph. Oh, that's awesome. So this is it, the future of selling manifesto. I love so it. Open, open up the pages though, because Eric yeah, I'll show you is one an of artist. My page, uh, because I like superheroes. So Me too. <laughs> I love it. That's so, awesome. So it's illustrated, and he created all the illustrations throughout this entire Oh, that book. is so cool. I so, love it. So tell everybody where they can find that book. Uh, well, they can go to this website. In fact, you know what? I, I would strongly recommend, especially because I know the people that is listening to this, uh, they, are, they are action takers. Would you agree? They're mm -hmm. action yes, takers. The Future of Selling book is a manifesto. So what it really does is it just talks about the sales practices that are outdated and it talks about the new rules of selling. So it's a good book to gain knowledge and to understand the selling world. But I'm gonna take a step further because um, when I when you invited me to do this interview, I was very clear that I wanted to share a lot of tactics with them. So there is a website that they can go, it's actually free of charge for all your all your listeners. It's double your sales in 2018.com. In it, there are eight strategies that can immediately help them double their sales. I've just shared one, which is the stay in touch strategy, but there's right. seven more in the book. Yeah, so they can go download it and go read it. So it's and double. That's fantastic. So double your sales double in 2018. Sales. Yes, dot com. Dot com. Double your sales dot in 2018.com. That and is Jason, incredible. You want to make sure that gets put up on the. Screen. We'll link that up okay. in in this uh, in the podcast. I really appreciate that, man. And for those that don't oh, follow you, where can they follow you online and get to know more about you and maybe even connect with you? Uh, Instagram, that, that's the place I hang out the most. Um, I think I'm addicted to Instagram. I love, I love that platform. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Eric Goes Global. Awesome. E-R-I-C, then Goes, G-O-E-S, then Global, G-L-O-B-A-L. Perfect, man. Well, awesome. I can't thank you enough for being on. Um, you're a wealth, a wealth of knowledge in the way that you convey it. I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's so natural. We talked about it in the last podcast, but it's so natural that it just, it's so conversational. No, it's like watching art. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like watching, wow. it's, it's, it's like very, watching art. It's, yeah. nice. it's, this is just my second podcast. I've never done a podcast before. This is like my second. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, well, you need to have your own so and we can help you do that um, for oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, okay. And we look forward yeah. to seeing you. We're going to make it to Singapore here at some point absolutely. in the near future. Yeah. And we want to come out there and, uh, and hang out. Absolutely. And we'll, connect, we'll stay in touch um, yeah. online and, um, um, you know, if there's any way I can help you guys or your followers, uh, do let me know. Just Absolutely. happy to connect with you. Thank you, Eric. I enjoyed meeting you. Thank you so much, guys. All right, guys. Very so much. with that, I'll see you in yeah. this is episode 78 of the Sales Wolves podcast. I am Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. We got Eric Fang in Singapore, and we are the Sales Wolves. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. See man. you next time. See you, bud.